Miss your favorite show? Download the podcast at kcaaradio.com. KCAA. Live and in color from the NBC News Radio Broadcasting Studios of KCAA, 1050 AM, 102.3 FM, and 106.5 FM, located in beautiful Southern California and in parallel from the Turfs Up Radio Studio in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Thanks for tuning in to the Water Zone Show this evening. Well, a pleasant afternoon, and to everybody listening to the Water Zone Show, just a small little correction. I don't think it's sunny in California today. I think they had some rain. And we're seeing that in Arizona as well. So uh, we go to Mr. Chris, uh, this man that I call the man of water, the wizard of water, the helper of hydraulics, every name I can think of. It's good. This guy knows everything. Chris, how are you doing tonight? Thanks, Rob. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. But the sun is peeking through every now and then. It's uh, it's more of a uh, it's more of a uh, occasional every now and then. But we have seen a couple. I mean, the last few days, Sunday through Wednesday, four straight days, it just pounded, just rain and rain and rain. Rob, I've got a four-inch um, rain gauge, you know, uh, that, that's nailed to one of the posts, exposed to, uh, but it's under my patio, but it's exposed. I changed it three times during the storm, and that doesn't count, you know, the extra half an inch or inch or whatever came in there in between times I was able to empty it and go out there without getting soaked and empty it. So we got a ton of rain and there's four to five feet of snow in the, in the local mountains. Um, I had a little cleanup, as you know, I talked about it earlier today, Rob, I had a little cleanup on my own back patio because um, I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing a turf to native conversion and, and some of that uh, dirt that was unimpeded up there, you know, ran down. I've got a half dozen, seven or eight little channels <laughs> carved into my backyard because I'm on a slope, you know that as well. And uh, so that I ended up with about an inch, inch and a half of uh, mud on my back patio. Well, that's why you're the highness of hydrology. You know all those answers. I Well, I, I appreciate it again. There's a, You should <laughs> get into poetry, Rob. I don't know if, if you've missed your, you know, your mocking <laughs> life there, buddy, but I'll tell you, last week, last week, you know, I was getting ready to tie up the boat in Idaho, but I'll tell you, it was crazy. <laughs> well, it's been a crazy week for me, as you know. So, anyway, uh, how's Miss Austin doing up there in California? Chris, how you, how you be? Hey, I'm doing great up here. We had rain and lots of rain and lots of rainy days, um, and it put, it put some feet of snow up in the mountains, but... Uh, not not the big boost perhaps that we would be hoping for, but definitely a lot of a lot of rain. And uh, you know the news too today is that January is again one of the hottest is the hottest month on record, which should be of no surprise since every month since July I believe has been the hottest month on record. So what we see is the Storms come through, and um, here they're dumping lots of rain and, and some snow, but not as much. And then in between the storms, these days come, the, the skies clear up. It's blue skies, beautiful, mild weather. Um, it, it's almost back to, it, I, it feels like fall. Yeah, I would say fall because we don't have any leaves on the trees. We don't have any flowers, but the temperatures are just so moderate and the you know, they tell us up here, "Oh, we broke temperature records." Today. So, uh, you know, it's uh it it's it's a mixed blessing. It's beautiful weather and and some water and yeah, uh in in our house uh, we have a water feature an intermittent water feature that comes with the property in the backyard that oh. <laughs> crops up <laughs> well i got i got to apologize for doing the intro because you know we all three talk before the show goes on air and we get our 2 minute and 30 second notice and i was just laughing at the stories you guys were talking about with the fish and all these other things which i'm sure we're going to talk about today, but 
but I, I, I it carried it over, and I was I, I couldn't stop laughing, and I'm trying to contain myself not to say the wrong <laughs> thing. But anyway, we got through that part. So anyway, audience, sorry about that, but uh, I, I have to laugh when I'm with both Chris's because they're good people and they're funny, and uh, I love working with them. So uh, I was going to play a, a, a thing of Crimea River, but uh, maybe I should change it to Crimea Lake because Tulare Lake is receding despite all these storms. <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of funny. Yesterday there was a story, uh, and it came from an academic institution, so that ought to be a sign about, you know, how Tulare is hanging in there. What was it? It, it wants to remain or something. And then, and that, of course, then prompted some stories of pointing out that, no, actually it is receding, and it's down to some 4,500 acres um, now, I think. Uh, let me go back up here. Yeah, 4,500. So that's not much. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's we, of course, they all want it to be nothing, but it's much less than it certainly was. Like it covered at one point 120,000 acres. Now it's down to 4,500. Um, and I'm sure this some of this water is going to pool there. But, I mean, the Tulare Lake formed because there was so much precipitation coming down that it overwhelmed the flood control systems that they had in the valley. And they had to put the water on this land uh, because it was straining the system. It was going to go somewhere. So they breached, they breached levees to make it go in at least places where they expected to go versus playing Russian roulette, like, let it all, we'll see, we'll just see what breaks, right? So, right. Um, you know, so the precipitation that we're having this year, it, in the Central Valley, they, I don't think they had uh, very much rain in this, la I mean, they had rain, but they didn't have rain like Southern California that had record-breaking rain, but they had rain, and, and all that precipitation is within... It, it, the system that's there now is able to handle it. So while there will be some addition to the lake because water will fall on the land, nearby land, and flow into it, um, they won't be having to release water onto the lake to, you know, because that the flood system's getting stressed. So, um, so hopefully by next year it'll be it'll be gone. We'll see. Well, well, well there were there were. Go ahead, Chris. There were some impoundments, Chris, that uh, that I know stopped releasing water. Oroville Dam, for particularly, right, it closed its main spillway. Uh, I think yesterday or day before yesterday. I can't remember. Yeah, Wednesday. I think they said Wednesday. They they closed it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know the storms are kind of moving out, so now the the reservoirs move from flood control to water supply, you know, holding on to what they can, but they have to keep uh, managing the water level to the flood control curves um, that they have. So that means that, yeah, even though we don't have a lot of snow up in the mountains, you know, we have to be careful about what we release. We still have to be conscious for flood control, but can't maybe hold on to as much as we might want to. But what's interesting is that we're really working on uh, on improving that. The state of California is. For one thing, this year they are going to be using the Airborne Snow Observatory um, more, which is a, a plane that flies over the Sierras and can look at the snowpack and can more accurately tell how much uh, water is in the snow that's above all these dams. We've never really been able to do that. Uh, you know, we have, we take a snow survey and you talk about the snow survey that comes, you know, once a, once a month up there. That's just the media show because, you know, the Sierra Nevada mountain range is 500 miles long. You can't tell how much snow is up in the Sierra by uh, measuring it in one point no matter what, where that point is. So they have a whole course of, of snow surveys that happen. They have actually have people that work for DWR that ski off, off of these courses once a month and go to these sensors in these uh, particular places and take measurements. And there's also a sensor network 
throughout the um, Sierra. But again, it, it's, you know, you're just taking point measurements. And so it's always been a little difficult to forecast how much is up there. So this, I believe this year will be the first year um, they're going to be using these airborne uh, surveys that will that will be much more accurate. And this is going to help, uh, you know, uh, help the water managers understand how much water uh, is up above their reservoir. And and we're working to create flood control curves that can be adjusted to you know actual measurements now. Yeah. It's better than one point only, as you said. But, you know, if we talk about that song, Crimea River, you still have the same issue going on in Merced River. Pretty dry. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and and we'll see what, what's going to come about that. The State Water Board is looking into that incident um, and has sent some letters around uh, regarding that. But we'll see, you know, the... The Merced River is an interesting case because they think that they say, you know, the state board investigated it. Um, oh, the story, I, we should tell the listeners, the story was in the New York Times uh, back in the middle of January that a river in California, the Merced River, had uh, so much water diversions come out of it that it was essentially dry. And what was also, you know, an interesting thing to note is that there's a stream gauge that the USGS has on that river, and it actually showed that the river was dry, and this was like for four months, and nobody noticed it or really did anything about it, uh, and I think it was sort of discovered almost in retrospect. So, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about that, and the state water board looked into it and said that it looks like um, that there were no illegal diversions that they that they could tell. Um, now, also in that area, we have groundwater, and groundwater is, you know, if you're pumping groundwater next to the river, then you're actually pumping river water, too. So, you know, how much did groundwater factor into that? We don't know, but uh, that's a big problem. Uh, you know, there. I think California has, what, <laughs> like over a thousand different streams and creeks and rivers and it's kind of hard to know what's going on in any one of those at any point in time uh, but the merced river is is not necessarily a small river so uh we'll see what happens with that so yeah i know yeah. chris we were, we were talking earlier about uh, about some uh, new thing that uh, newsom is doing with uh Oh, yeah. So, Chris, why don't you go ahead and lead into that, because oh, that was yeah. something you're interested Well, I'll tell you, uh, before we get Chris to comment on it, you know, you, Chris and you and uh, Rob, you know that I follow, that I've got sort of a side hobby, and I follow the wildlife stuff that happens in California. So, Chris, um, you know, your comments on this, if you will, right? So, last week, Newsom released the salmon strategy, right? So, I mean, you know, it was, it's it's meant to to look at climate change and the effect it's having on California coastal uh, fish populations, salmon uh, particularly. And there's also a, oh my gosh, I just thought about this. There's also the sea otter story that that was on your thing. That oh um, yeah, yeah, that, that's good. Oh, I mean, just remember that. I'm glad I did. It was an awesome story. I enjoyed enjoyed reading that. But back on back on the on Newsom's uh, salmon strategy, just released by the way. I guess what I don't understand, Chris, is what's where's the controversy? I mean, you've got groups like Nature Conservancy, Trout Unlimited, Cal Trout, all those guys hailing it as a great idea and thank you. We waited so long. What took you so long? Where's the controversy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, well, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in the salmon strategy, um, and there it does have the support of um, – you know, Nature Conservancy, like you said, Cal Trout, Trout Unlimited, the Northern California Water Association. Um, the criticism usually comes, um, it, it, it comes in this case because of the, uh, they don't think there's enough flows dedicated to it. They want more flow in the river. And 
and also, you know, like uh, one, the Golden State Salmon Association says, yeah, lots of good stuff here, but, you know, there's the Newsom administration is still building the Delta Tunnel Project in Bites Reservoir, which they see as, you know, detrimental to salmon populations as well. So, you know, it's a mixed bag. <laughs> Usually things in California sure. are. Um but, you know, I think at this point, anything that we do to help out the salmon is a good thing. Um, and, you know, perfect should not be the enemy of the good, right? So, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But, let's, let's see, if you don't mind, let's just ping on that California sea otter thing because I guess, you know, um, I can't, I, I don't have time to bring the story back up and, and read it, but. It's a team of scientists. They've really discovered that, you know, in the last 50 years, as the efforts have gone on to protect California sea otters, which, by the way, as all of us know, were pretty much hunted to the edge of extinction, as the as the saying goes. But um, they also discovered that because of the rebound in California otters, right, the otters' success story, it's led to something pretty much just as remarkable, and that's the restoration of coastal marsh habitat. So I don't... I don't yeah. know if you remember all of all of it. Uh, I think Chris, isn't but, it? I think uh, I read I read something about it. They eat crabs. Yeah. They're eating crabs that that eat into the marsh. Uh, so yeah. they're you know they're actually helping out with the erosion problems because they're they're eating the crabs. You know, it, it, there's a reason why we <laughs> species are around. And, uh, you know, invasive species are a problem because they don't have a predator. So, you know, th this is kind of nature at its best, sort of, you know, helping us out here. Uh, or we're helping it out, I say, I should say, by reestablishing these otter populations. Yeah, so my daughter was in Morro, oh, uh, no, sorry, up in Monterey Bay, and uh, she sent us a picture. This was, this was in the fall of last year. And uh, just zooming in on it, she took a number of pictures. I mean, there's there's otters are full, packed. I mean, it's not like a carpet of otters. You can walk on water, but there was a lot there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's great. It's great yeah. to see them come back and have a positive impact. Um, you know, beavers coming back, that's another thing. Um, you know, beavers kind of can be a touch controversial because it, they can be – damaging to to landowners' property where they build their dams and stuff. But there was a story, interesting story last week. Um, I think it was called How to Baffle a Beaver. And they found that uh, it's the sound of running water that, that triggers the beavers to build dams, you know, to sort of dam up the water to make the water sound stop running. So they actually use that to make them, like, build dams where they want them and, and not where yeah. they don't want them, you know. So yeah. uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. It is. Well, what's happening with all these, I hear that the California is getting a lot of trees that are dying. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, drought and bark beetle infestation and, I guess, and wildfires, uh, you know, it's uh, it's wreaking havoc on our forests, and that should be no surprise. Um, I I came back. I drive up to Reno, and I came back one time a, a couple months ago through the Feather River Canyon um, because the other way was a little bit clogged. And the Feather River Canyon Highway goes to an area where they had, I think, the campfire and a couple other fires back there. And um, just the tree death was really sad to see, and it, it's extensive. And um, and along with that tree death comes the mudslides, and the road is getting forever washed out. It just got washed out again. Um, boulders coming down. And uh, and also looking at the Feather River because of the drought, uh, <laughs> it it got a lot of uh, Phragmites, I would say. I think is what they're called. Those reedy bushes that 
kind of come up along the shoreline and make it hard to get to the river. <laughs> you know, they had a lot of that through there. So it's really sad to see what the drought and wildfire have done, um, you know, to the landscape. Uh, and, yeah, tree death is, you know, we're really going – where California's forests are getting transformed, just, they're not. A lot of areas are not going to ever look like they did before. Well, unfortunately, the world is changing drastically with with climate and everything else, and water shortages and things. So, oh it's yeah, getting, getting dangerous. But well, we're gonna we're gonna get take a, a a short break and then be back for our special guest. Chris, we thank you for, for joining us every single week. And for those who listen to this, go to mavensnotebook.com, become a subscriber. It's the best way to get information about what's happening in the water world in California. And you can also become a sponsor, which is a great thing. And she has a new thing that we talked about last week on the show, where you can go on and get some information about uh, books about water and get, get a synopsis of what that is uh, from Justin Scott Coe. So that's a good thing that she has going, and uh, we support that a thousand percent. So, Chris, thank you very much. We we love you to death. All right, see you guys. See you guys later. All right, great week, Bye-bye. Chris. All right, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with our featured guest. So stick around. We'll be right back. NBC News on KCAA Loma Linda, sponsored by Teamsters Local 1932, protecting the future of working families, Teamsters1932.org. You know the benefits of installing drainage. You've seen how to diagnose the most common stormwater management problems. So where do you go next? Site One, partnered with NDS, has the tools and resources you need to enter this profitable new category. A rule of thumb is that 90% of customers will take their contractor's advice on landscape work. If you're installing hardscaping or irrigation, your recommendation already holds weight. Site One can make sure it holds water too. Their branch drainage pros are trained in stormwater and drainage best practices, and they are your go-to for simple answers to complex project questions. And Site One University provides the training to take your company to the next level, equipping you with the tools you need to raise industry standards and provide the best solutions to your customers. There is specific training available for erosion and drainage, as well as other green industry educational tracks, taught in both English and Spanish. In addition, NDS offers professional drainage contractor certification training through a variety of learning paths, with both in-person and online courses available. NDS certification has many benefits to grow your business, including a listing on the Find a Contractor page on the NDS website. When it's time to develop bids, you can turn to NDS DesignWorks. Just submit your drawing at ndspro.com backslash submit your design, and a team of civil engineers will evaluate it for best practices and make recommendations on how to incorporate NDS products into your project. Need to calculate runoff or make sure your project is sized right? Use an NDS calculator to determine peak flow runoff, pipe sizing, and flow well and easy flow detention volumes. Just go to ndspro.com or download the free NDS Stormwater mobile app. For help getting the word out about your new services, the NDS team can provide marketing and collateral materials, including yard signs, door hangers, brochures, and postcards. NDS also offers digital marketing support to improve your company website and drive property owners to your business. And if you found this video helpful, there's more where it came from. Subscribe to NDS Stormwater Management on YouTube for access to a library of over 70 videos covering everything from drainage installation training to product overviews and even testimonials from other contractors. Before we wrap this up, I've got one final piece of advice, and it's an important one. After the first rainfall following every installation, give your customers a call to see how your system performed. Not only will it show your confidence in your work, it will help build your reputation and earn you more referrals. Thanks for tuning in today. Stormwater management and drainage are profitable additions to the service portfolio of any irrigation or hardscape contractor who's motivated to take their business to the next level. When you're ready to begin your journey, Site One and NDS have the tools and resources you need to succeed as a drainage contractor. Welcome 
that's the second half of the uh, water zone. Hope everybody's having a great day and maybe uh, uh, kind of celebrating because the rain has come and gave us some water that we needed, but also it's drying up so we can have a nice, nice day and a nice evening. So that should be good. Uh, Chris and I had an opportunity to uh, get with uh, a nice lady from uh, a water agency in the San Bernardino County Municipal Water District, and her name is Heather Dyer. And uh, so we did a little speaking with her, and uh, let's listen to that. Today to have the uh, Chief Executive Officer and General Manager of the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District, Ms. Heather Dyer, with us. So, Heather, welcome to the River Water Zone Show. Thank you for having me, Rob. We we always start off the conversation to make it casual, uh, and the whole thing will be casual anyway, so you don't have to worry about that, is what drove you to the water industry? I know you have a, a different background, and our listeners would probably be curious about that. Yeah, you're right. I do have a different background. I'm actually an endangered fisheries biologist by training. And I stumbled into California water uh, kind of by accident. I was working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the time as the Santa Ana River biologist. I had been living in Louisiana for 11 years before, and I got both of my biology degrees in Louisiana out to the west coast here to Carlsbad, California for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Of course, that's a big draw. Uh, and so I, I spent a year there working in the Carlsbad office and they sent me out to the Santa Ana River. And I'll never forget the first time I went out there, they sent me to an area that if you've been out to the Santa Ana River, you know that the entire river is not always wet. There's not always water in it. And so you have to go to the spot or downstream of the spot where the wastewater effluent comes into the river in order to actually see a flowing river. They sent me to a different spot that was completely dry. And I thought to myself, well, that's weird. I wonder if they realize I'm actually a fish biologist and I don't know what I'm supposed to do out here looking at a dry riverbed. Uh, but it kind of started my interest in a very complex system that had uh, you know, great demands on the water uh, resources of Southern California, the Santa Ana River watershed. It also had a lot of endangered species issues because when water is scarce, of course, there's always, you know, some trade-offs that have to be made. And so I started thinking about how do you build water supply projects in a river system with very little water and lots of competing needs? So I started working with this water agency, San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District, and the partner agencies from around the watershed. And we just started working the problem, uh, you know, looking at the very first thing, how do you take water out of the river when there's many species dependent on that very water? And I just started establishing relationships and I just found a passion for it. It's the most complex set of problems that I can think of trying to solve for so many different variables in that equation. And so coming from a science background, working with all these great engineers, other scientists, we just started working our way down that problem list and trying to find win-win solutions that everyone could buy into. Well, pretty, pretty interesting. You know, Chris uh, Chris is big into fishing and likes rivers and oceans and things. So Chris, I'll turn it to you for a second. All right, I appreciate it. So you're so you're on you're part of the state, the state um, water project, right? And so you're a, you're a municipal water district. So you're part of uh, you're a state water contractor as part of that. Then so kind of kind of give us the thirty thousand foot view of what your uh, service area is, um, you know, population, how many connections you've got, other agencies you service, maybe a little history as well, Heather. Yeah, so the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District, I'll just call it San Bernardino Valley from now on, that's a mouthful. We were formed in 1954, and we were actually established by the voters of this area. There was a decision to be made. They knew that they needed to bring in a supplemental water supply. They also knew that they were sitting on a very valuable asset in the Bunker Hill groundwater basin. And that had sustained this region and its tremendous agriculture resources for a lot of years. But they did recognize in the 40s and 50s that they needed to bring in that supplemental water supply because you can't always count on it raining here. 
And so the voters at that time, there was a lot of discussion about whether this region should join the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and become one of their member agencies. And the voters actually voted twice against that for a couple of different reasons. Again, they recognized the value of their groundwater basin and the tremendous asset that that would be to this area over time. They also uh, realized that, you know, the Colorado River water was going to be one of the sources of supplemental water, but that it did have some water quality issues that they didn't necessarily want to bring into this groundwater basin. And so the voters decided to establish uh, an independent agency, which is San Bernardino Valley. They also voted for us to become a state water contractor. And so we are one of those uh, agencies that has invested billions of dollars over the years in the state water project. I can't tell you how valuable that investment has been to this region over time. It's about 30, 27 to 30 percent of our annual water supply um, in terms of the allocation. So it is that supplemental water supply that we needed that we recognized we needed to be able to bring in water in during wet years in northern california bring it into southern california and use it during the dry times the amount of foresight that the predecessors of this agency and the people over the years who have worked here had is just amazing um, and so we're very thankful for that then in 1969, you might be familiar, there was a huge lawsuit in the Santa Ana River. I think there was something like 4,000 litigants at kind of fighting over the water resources of the San, Santa Ana River. And so San Bernardino Valley at that time in 1969, we had our role expand in that the court actually named us as the water master, the co-water master with Western Municipal Water District as the the responsible agency to make sure that this groundwater basin and all of its resources and the river are uh, taken care of and that all of our obligations are met. So San Bernardino Valley is the water master on behalf of all of the pumpers of the San Bernardino parties within that judgment. And so our job is really to make sure that that groundwater resource of the Bunker Hill Basin and the, the sub basins adjacent is always kept whole. So our pumpers can pump as much water as they want because San Bernardino Valley is the steward of those resources and brings in water supplies to refill that groundwater basin behind the pumping. And so now what that looks like is, yes, we're a state water contractor. We bring in water from Northern California. We recharge as much as we can. We serve it to the different agencies who want to take direct delivery of that water. But we're also investing heavily in bringing in new water supply. Um, which I'm sure we'll talk about a couple of those big projects, local water resources, stormwater capture, recycled water, all of that with the goal of fulfilling those obligations that we have to that 1969 judgment on behalf of all the parties of the San Bernardino pumpers. So San Bernardino Valley, you you also service lo some local agencies. Is that what I just heard heard you say? And how many of those are there? We serve 15 different retail agencies. They go from, you know, big municipal water agencies that are retail. They have their their customers and some small mutual water companies, some cities, city of Redlands, for instance, city of Colton, about 325 square miles, uh, serving about 740,000 people. Um, and then if you look at the adjacent communities that also depend on a whole functioning Bunker Hill groundwater basin, it goes out into the millions. It's really interesting when you think about how do you proactively and collaboratively manage a shared asset such as a groundwater aquifer. And so it takes a lot of, like I said earlier, really strong relationships. Yeah, looking at looking at the water usage, if we can, for just a second, right, like commercial and residential customers on one side and then ag on the other. What's what's the split for you? Because I know you guys have some ag customers as well. We do have some ag customers. Uh, the agriculture has definitely declined over the years, but we do have some big users that have a lot of citrus groves still, for instance. But certainly the residential and commercial use has kind of become more of our bread and butter uh, water, water usage, I guess you could say. Interestingly enough, though, you know, we had those really strong mandates in 2015 when we were in several years of 
you know, really severe drought. And there were state mandates that said you needed to cut your water usage by, you know, X percentages, uh, especially on the residential commercial side. And interesting, our users have not rebounded, um, you know, significantly over that 2015 reduction levels. So what we're seeing is that the new residential is so efficient compared to the existing homes that even though we've had a lot of growth in terms of homes and commercial usage, we still haven't had uh, a significant uptick in the water use over you know, the last five to seven years, which is great because what we're trying to promote is that the more water we leave in that groundwater basin, the more it will be available in the future during those drought years. And the way our strategy works is that during the wet Northern California years, like last year, we really try to recharge as much of that water as possible and deliver it to those resale agencies if they can take it so that we can rest those wells and rest the groundwater aquifer and save that water for the future. One more quick question, because I want to hand it back to Rob. I know he wants to ask you about project stuff, but re but real quickly, do you, from a source from a source standpoint, Heather, um, surface water versus groundwater, kind of where does that sit for you guys? Groundwater is the largest percentage. Like I said, we have about 20 percent, uh, 27 percent of imported supply. So you know, it's probably in the 30. 40% range right now of groundwater. Um, that get that changes in any given year. We are, we just recently actually just finished construction of some new recharge basins that will accept recycled or highly treated wastewater from two different agencies, uh, East Valley Water District and the City of San Bernardino Municipal Water uh, Department. And so they'll be delivering highly treated wastewater into these new basins that we built, will own and operate for about uh, 16,000 acre feet, which, you know, uh, if you compare that to our annual state water contract allotment is about 100,000 acre feet. So 16,000 acre feet of drought proof recycled water going in the ground is, you know, not a large percentage, but it is steady and dependable over time because people just, you know, keep flushing their toilets. So we're trying very hard to diversify that water portfolio so that we can have those different sources that will make us resilient over time. Well, you know, between your enhanced recharge project, you know, expanding the groundwater, um, you did a lot of things um, and maybe you can expand a little more on what you did through the drought period uh, to, to enhance customers uh, uh, to use water more efficiently. What were some of the activities that you, you've done? So we have a slightly different, uh, we call it our demand management program. We've tried lots of different things over the years. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Some worked better than others. One interesting thing that, uh, you know, really sometimes frustrates me at the state level is that not every region is the same. And so a lot of times, you know, we try to use the same tool for a different job and it just doesn't work as well. So we've, we've tried, you know, turf removal rebates. We've tried all the different, you know, devices that you can give away, um, you know, shower nozzles, et cetera. What we found was that worked best is that we as the wholesale water provider basically offer a financial incentive to our retail agencies to just use less water. And we don't tell them how they're going to do that. We say we will provide you a certain many dollars per acre foot. Um, if you compare your reduction of water use compared to our baseline year, which was 2020, we'll just give you a check and you figure out what works best for your customers. So some of our retail agencies have found really good success with weather based irrigation controllers. Other agencies have found better success with turf removal or other different strategies. So this last year, we actually saw a huge increase in the participation of our demand management program. We gave away $750,000 to the retail agencies. We gave out the big checks uh, and they figure out what works best for their customers. So that was fantastic. In the meantime, what we were doing during the drought is that we were preparing and doing all of the many, many necessary steps to be able to build local water projects. So we spent 10 years working on a huge programmatic uh, environmental regulatory compliance program 
that provides a 50 year permit for all of the different water projects that we need to build over the next 50 years, which includes stormwater capture projects, recycled water projects, maintenance of our pipelines. And this is not just on behalf of San Bernardino Valley, but on behalf of 11 different water agencies in our region. And so it's this programmatic approach to environmental compliance that while it's a big investment on the front end, it pays off over decades. So we spent those years working on this environmental compliance program so that now we're actually building projects in such a fast pace that we can barely keep up. We are building stormwater capture projects and recycled water projects that are really increasing the amount of water that we can get in the ground. So it was kind of a, a two part approach. Let's incentivize people to leave water in the ground or use less water. And while we're doing that, let's also prepare for the coming decades. Well, I, I have a friend that you probably know, Fiona Sanchez. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the conversations we had, I was at a couple of meetings with her in the DWR, talking about, uh, you know, they all want every all water agencies to reduce their uh, usage uh, for their customers. And um, one of the problems that Fiona brought up, which I kind of kind of agree to, is, you know, way back when, when we had the big drought, everybody, you know, the governor said, hey, uh, cut 25 percent. Well, people achieved that with smart irrigation controllers and soil moisture sensors and turf removal and all of that. There gets to be a point where if you what else more can you do? Because water districts will lose money uh, on, on trying to push further. I mean, there's always a limit to what you can do. I mean, unless it's a drastic thing where everything's going to be mandated that you, you get down to, you know, uh, uh, 30 gallons per person per day. I mean, I don't see that happening in, in, in the very near future. But what what do you think about that, the way DWR and everybody's pushing that we got to get down more and more? Just people reduce to 25 percent. And how much more do you want them to do? I mean, it, it only gets to a certain limit where the next thing to do is just turn the water off. Yeah, well, I mean... If you think about it, let's say in your own personal budget, you know, you had a, a reduction of income. And so you started thinking, oh, OK, I got to really tighten the belt and spend less. So you squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. But there comes a point you can't squeeze that out any further. Right. Because you need a, a roof over your head and you need food for your children and you need gas in your car so you can go to work. So what's your alternative? Probably you go out and you find another source of income and you find a second job. And so one thing that is frustrating is there seems to sometimes be a lack of recognition that we've invested heavily in building very expensive recycled water projects that depend on water coming through the wastewater treatment system so that we can then put it into the ground. And if you squeeze so tight that we are not having the source of inflows that these agencies are counting on, then you really create a stranded asset situation in terms of the advanced planning that we've already done. And, and also, like you said, it threatens to disrupt some of our water retail agencies in their, the stability of their finances. Even really large uh, you know, agencies that we all know, if you start selling so little water that it destabilizes that agency, then what have you really accomplished. And so what I'm hoping for is that we really take a different approach and we're trying to do this. Um, I'm one of the kind of agencies trying to, one of the people trying to promote SB 366, California Water for All, that we turn that formula, that the paradigm on its head and we say, okay, instead of regulating for scarcity, let's start planning for abundance. The modeling doesn't show that we're going to have less water in the future. It shows that it is going to come to California in different forms and different patterns than have seen, been seen in the past. So, for example, there's some predictions that based on temperature increases due to a changed climate, we could lose our Sierra Nevada snowpack. That's 17 million acre feet per year of lost storage. <laughs> So how do we plan a water infrastructure system in California that will offset the loss of 17 million acre feet per year? Clearly, we have to build more storage capacity, whether that's above ground or below ground, more conveyance to get water from Northern California or wherever it is that it's falling to the users, to groundwater storage, for instance, 
create those connections between the different agencies so we can facilitate trades. My point being that we need to plan in a different way because the future does not look like the past. And so I'm really focused on there have to be ways that we can build smart water projects. There has to be ways that we can work with Northern California irrigation districts, with Central California farmers, with Southern California urban, so that we can develop the water resources that we need to catch those wet years and use it during dry years. Well, that's that's the great way to do it. Um, tell us a little bit, I know you have some special projects and then you got some awards, but uh, talk about for our listening audience about what the Inland Empire brine line is. Oh, the, the brine line, the famous brine line. It yeah. actually is a, it's a pipeline that goes from the Yukaipa area uh, all the way down to the ocean. Orange County Sanitation District is kind of the end point for the brine line and they uh, treat the brine. So whenever you have recycled water, for instance, or other types of projects that, uh, you know, they need to discharge their minerals and salts uh, into this pipeline that will carry them out to Orange County Ta Sanitation District and then into the ocean. And for instance, this is a really important asset for us so that we can do recycled water projects, um, especially reverse osmosis, which is a way that you can kind of keep reusing water over and over again. But you have to have a place to put those salts. You don't want to discharge, for instance, very salty water into your groundwater basin because that that declines the, the quality of your water, your groundwater over time. And so the brine line is a very important asset that we're so fortunate to have. Um, I think it was built in the around 70s and 80s. And there's five different agencies who banded together to build this piece of infrastructure. And if you think about it, it's actually was a good model for what we do now in terms of our, our big infrastructure investments that we're focused on now. You asked me about some of our projects. So for instance, our Enhanced Recharge Stormwater Capture Project, that is a project that takes new water rights that were um, given in 2010 by the State Water Resources Control Board to San Bernardino Valley and Western Municipal on behalf of their parties in the Riverside area. And this captures new stormwater that's captured behind Seven Oaks Dam and we put it into recharge basins and we get it into our groundwater aquifer. That's a project one agency probably couldn't have done on its own. It requires working with different landowners, uh, using water resources that are shared amongst three or four agencies. So we're sharing costs, we're sharing the water, um, and we're sharing the land resources and also kind of all of the environmental permitting obligations that we have. So that's a great example of, you know, kind of we took this model of first the brine line and then our habitat conservation plan, which is how we're doing our programmatic environmental permitting. That model that has been successful for this region, working together, everybody bringing their resources to the table and then figuring out how do we share the benefits? And that is now spreading. And I, I want to just share one more project that's so important to California Water Sites Reservoir. This is another very innovative model about how the entire state of California water managers can work together. It's an above ground reservoir, but it does not block any fish passage. It takes water off of the Sacramento River during the highest flows stores it off channel in this reservoir and then releases water back into the environment to be, go through the delta and then get delivered to the downstream users during dry times. The great part about this project is not just the innovation of how it's designed, but also the partnerships. So there's Northern California irrigation districts and farming entities. There's, uh, you know, coastal and inland agencies from Central California and their Southern California urban water management agencies working together. And we're all sharing the costs. We will share the operational strategies and we share the benefits. And again, this is a project that no one agency could have afforded on its own. They couldn't have planned it on its own. It requires the collaboration of different landowners, different agencies that bring some skills and funding to the table. And when you put it all together, it really is magic. And I guess that's what I'm proposing, that we just expand through California Water for All SB 366. We say, how much water do we need for the future? And what are our options to build for that goal? 
and no major project has ever gotten done without setting the goals. And so that's what we're promoting is like, let's set a goal to have an abundant California water supply for decades to come. And then let's get all these smart people around the table and figure out how to build it. That's that's the right strategy. Uh, I have one or two more questions, but let me ask one and then I'm gonna turn the rest over to Chris. Tell us a little about your resilience roadmap that you guys have going. Yeah, so we recognized uh, there was a few big wake up calls. I'll just remind everyone um, there was a, a huge freeze in Texas where those municipal agencies weren't ready. And so that was kind of a wake up call and like, oh, my gosh, what are our pipelines going to do? We probably don't have to worry about huge freezes, but we do have to worry about huge atmospheric rivers that have a tremendous amount of flow all at one time. So I started thinking about what's the risk to our pipelines? What's the risk to our residents in terms of a resilient water supply? all these different things. And so we started working on a climate adaptation and resilience plan, examining what is our risk to our agency and the people that we serve in terms of a reliable, sustainable water supply for a hundred years. And how can we really work towards making ourselves resilient and adaptable to those risks? And so we're almost done. We're gonna bring it to our board here sometime this year in 2024. And it says all the things that we need to do to essentially make sure that San Bernardino Valley is always providing either the imported water, the groundwater resources, or all of the different environmental obligations that we have. How are we prepared and delivering those results that we have committed to? And so it's just a really exciting plan. We also look at what is our contribution to the climate change um, problem that we have and how can we reduce our own impact on the environment. But it's really focused on, we know we wanna provide a resilient, sustainable future for the people that we serve. How are we going to do that and what are the the steps that we need to put into play as soon as possible. Great. That's a, that's an absolutely great summary. I'm just going I'm going to I'm going to ask one more question myself because Rob did turn it over to me and you know he he always he always considers whether he's going to do that or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> so conservation, efficiency, recycling, reuse, all that stuff, it's still important, Heather, right? I mean, and, and for you guys as well. So kind of what's your, what's your look at in the future for San Bernardino Valley in, in, uh, in looking at those four subjects? Critical. It's all critical, right? Just like your retirement por portfolio, you've got to have that diversity in your portfolio. So we are working on all fronts, again, shoring up our state water project investments, working on new local supply, incentivizing the retail agencies and the end users to use less so we can save it for the future. All of those things are very, very important. And I would say even to take a step beyond that, to promote the idea that we are not owners of these resources and assets. We are stewards of these resources. The people have made us the stewards such that it will always be available for this generation and the future generations. And that is a responsibility that we take very seriously. And so we're very focused on making sure that we do our part to ensure that this resource is available, a reliable, sustainable water supply for all the people of this region and beyond. Wow. <clears throat> I got to tell you, Heather, when people hear and see you, they go, wow. And you're a wow person, which stands for women of water. And we appreciate oh. that. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, you, you're awesome. And uh, keep on doing the great work. You're a good leader. And uh, I, I see good future for your agency and yourself. And uh, thank you for joining us on The Water Zone. We appreciate it. You're so welcome. It was a pleasure. I love being an ambassador for collaboration and those win-win solutions, because I know we can achieve this if we put our heads together and, and really put some effort into it. Love your passion. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Well, it was awesome, Chris. It was. I mean, you know, dynamic, fearless, right? A real treat uh, having her on the water zone, Ron. Yeah. Well, it's time we got to say goodbye and uh, try to go outside and get a little uh, nice weather for a few minutes. <laughs> Anyway, what we have to tell everybody at the end of our show is please help keep our planet blue. Mm -hmm. If you like 
If you like blue, you can get green as well. Anyway, have a good week. We'll see you next week. Good night, everybody. Good night. NBC News on KCAA Loma Linda, sponsored by Teamsters Local 1932, protecting the future of working families, Teamsters1932.org. Radio. I'm Brian Shook. President Biden says his classified documents case is officially closed. Biden today in Leesburg, Virginia, praised the special counsel's decision not to file charges against him for retaining classified documents. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. President Biden plans to take new substantive action to help prevent such mistakes in the future. The report concluded Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified military and national security documents, but will not face charges. The report also noted that Biden voluntarily returned the documents and cooperated with the investigation. The Supreme Court hearing on whether Colorado can remove Donald Trump from its primary ballot has ended. A decision is expected before the Super Tuesday primaries next month. The case stems from a Colorado Supreme Court decision ruling Trump engaged in in insurrection and can be removed from the state's primary ballot. A bill to provide aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan is moving forward in the Senate. The Senate voted in favor of advancing the foreign aid package today after Republicans in the chamber rejected a broader bill including border policy changes. The 67 to 32 vote means the Senate can begin consideration of the $95 billion package. Stocks are higher to close the day on Wall Street. Liz Warner reports. The S&P 500 continues to hover around 5,000 as it looks to hit that mark for the first time ever. Meantime, Disney saw its best day since December of 2020 after yesterday's first quarter earnings report. At the closing bell today, the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 49 points, the S&P 500 rose three points, and the Nasdaq added 37 points. Former President Trump is expected to get a decisive win in tonight's Nevada Republican Caucus. You're listening to the latest from NBC News Radio. K C A A. Was your car involved in an accident or just need help with dents? All Magic Paint and Body Collision Centers, in business for over 30 years. Their highly trained staff and certified technicians and friendly staff are the best in the business and treat each car as if it was their own. All Magic Paint and Body Collision Centers are family owned and offer state of the art equipment and tools to ensure optimum results. They use the latest technology in computerized color matching and specialize in frame repairs. With their modern laser measuring systems, they're OEM certified and they have four locations to serve you. All Magic Paint and Body Collision Centers offer rental car assistance with free drop off and pickup services too. And their work has a lifetime guarantee. All Magic Paint and Body Collision Centers are in Norco. East Vale, Marino Valley, and in Fontana. Call them at 1 800 61 Magic. That's 1 800 61 Magic. All Magic Paint and Body Collision Centers. 1 800 61 Magic. All Magic Paint and Auto Body says drive carefully. Dutch Bakery and Variety Foods in Ontario is reminding everyone to please give blood. By doing so, you may save the life of a child, surgery patient, or an accident victim. So give blood. It's safe, it's simple, and it's needed. This message, courtesy of your friends at Dutch Bakery and Variety Foods in Ontario. For a great selection of imported food from Holland and Indonesia and knowledgeable, friendly service, visit 1051 West Philadelphia Street in Ontario or call 909-983-6022. They're on the air because they care. Redlands Ranch Market is a unique, full-service international grocery store that specializes in authentic food items from Mexico, India, and from many Mediterranean and Asian countries, including popular items from the U.S. They offer fresh-baked items from their in-house bakery, house-made tortillas from their tortilleria, a delicious array of prepared Mexican foods, a terrific fresh fruit and juice bar, and a large selection of meats, seafoods, and deli sandwiches, salads, and halal meats. Their produce department is stocked full with fresh local and 
and hard to find international fruits and vegetables that you cannot find anywhere else. Don't forget to stop into the massive Beer Cave and experience the largest selection of domestic, artisan, and imported beers in the IE. They can also cater your next event with one of their delicious takeout catering trays of food. Visit them at RedlandsRanchMarket.com. That's RedlandsRanchMarket.com. Redlands Ranch Market, a unique and fun shopping destination. And now, the voices of KCAA with an exciting announcement. Want to hear NBC News or KCAA anywhere you go? Well, now there's an app for that. KCAA is celebrating 25 years and our silver anniversary with a brand new app. The new KCAA app is now available on your smart device, cell phone, in your car, or any place. Just search KCAA on Google Play or in the Apple Store. One touch and you can listen on your car radio, Bluetooth device, Android Auto, or Apple CarPlay. Catch the KCAA buzz in your earbuds or on the streets, celebrating 25 years of talk, news, and excellence with our new KCAA app. Just do it and download it. KCAA, celebrating 25 years. Miss your favorite show? Download the podcast at kcaaradio.com. KCAA.
share with me that time of feelings understood in that place we called home cause I love my people sending out much love for you on a fantastic Thursday you know it must be the five o'clock drive huh Ain't nobody going to do it like us right here. In the 5 o'clock hour, hello family, how are you? Once again, welcome to Think Big Incorporated with your man Bishop Harold Jackson. Doing what we do. It's all about giving you the best music ever. You know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take your favorite music and my favorite music and make this your favorite time of day. How about that? Oh man, I'm telling you, I am jazzed about today. Today we are going to have a ball. Fun is on the menu. F-U-N is on the menu. And I'm telling you straight up, we're going to have a ball. 7 o'clock is going to come so fast. So I would advise you to hit your best friend. T- text your enemies. Let them know. I wouldn't care. Text your enemies. Let them know. Say, hey, they getting down. Man, Bishop's getting down right there. KCAA. That's right. KCAA 106.5 on your FM and Express 1050 on the AM. You know how we do it. Man, hey, we got nothing but love for you. Loving all our people, like I said, for the drive at five. And we got a word for you today. Yes, indeed. You know, we always give you some buffalo wings and cheese dip to work with. Yes, for those of you who miss lunch or, you know, or you just need a spiritual feeding. You just need a spiritual feeding. We got you. For those of you who are going through a little something, well, I've been feeling your pain. I have been feeling your pain, so I decided to just reach out and see if I could do something about it. And you know what you do, man. When you're dealing with something and you need help, you go to the pros. That's what you do. You go to the pros. You don't uh, go to individuals that really just going to try to tell you something. No, you go to the pros. And I got pros in the house today. I told you yesterday that I was jazzed. I was very excited about today. And today is here. It's Thursday. And you know, today is so great. It stopped raining. Mm-hmm. My guests are so great, they just wave their hands across the sky and pop, they just stop raining, man. I said, Lord Jesus. Yeah, they got it going on. So it's a beautiful day. When we're doing what we do, bringing great music to you, and we're going to bring a word to you. I have an individual in the house that I am so proud of. I can say I probably know them better than most people on the planet. Um, we're very close. And uh, I, it's an honor just to have just to have them here. I have my brother, Mr. Tony Carruthers, in the, in the house. How you feeling, Tony? Feeling really good, Bishop. I'm so happy that you invited us here. Man, yeah. And, uh, it's always a pleasure to be in your presence. I'll Man, tell you that. I'm gonna tell you. J- <laughs> just so Guy Black doesn't call me and tell me to tell you to move that mic closer to your mouth, <laughs> move the mic closer to your mouth now. Because okay. Guy Black would tell me, say, tell him to move that mic close to his mouth, man. This is for you, Guy. That's right. The pro, get that mic just the way you want it, man. And uh, like I said, we get, it gets no better than this. It gets no better than this. I have the one and only. I have the one and only. My younger sister is in the house. She hasn't done this with me. And uh, so, man, and she, I'm, hey, she's been there for everybody. And we're going to talk about that. But she has, you know what? But she has graced she has great Think Big Incorporated because she has found time, man. This is the busiest woman on the planet besides Dr. Mary. She, man, and I am so glad to have the one and only Maddie Carruthers in the house. How are you, baby? Oh, How Bishop, are you? Thank huh? you so much, brother. You know? I appreciate you so much. I'm so glad to be here, okay? This is an honor for me, okay, to have my big brother have me to be interviewed by him. So thank you so much. Oh wow! Well, you know what we, we 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 what we're going to do is we aren't going to do any interviewing. What we're going to do is we just going we just going to chop it up and talk and help individuals out by way of our lifestyles I because we that. have been so blessed. You know, we have been so blessed, all three of us. You know, yeah, and yeah, yes. and, and it's, it's Tony. You remember uh, the movie Three the Hard Way? Three the Hard Three Way. Three the Hard Way. Yes. Yeah, well, we've been blessed, but it ain't been hard the hard way. You no, know, no. been in some ups and downs, but it hasn't been the hard way. That's how you do it. Yeah, you that's gotta, how you do you it. You gotta have that to get to the next step. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, and that's what we want to talk about. We want to talk to all of you, all of you who have been going through some things. All of you who are going through a little something, something about right now. You turn around and say, Bishop, you know what? You need to give me a right now word because I need a right now word. Well, we got that for you. We have a right now word for you today and we're going to be hooking you up. Um, 
we were debating on what we wanted to talk about and they were so gracious because I do believe that we all came together in one accord and said today what we're going to do is we are going to talk about your assignment in life because most individuals will go through life not really knowing why they even made it this far mm. you know if you ask an individual why have you made it this far how have you made it this far they can't tell you right they can't tell you they don't have an answer you know Wow, wow, man, how did I make it this far? Uh, uh, some people, and you know, back in the day, man, we called it luck. I know. It. You know what I'm saying? Still, the, you know, mama's at the house praying for you like crazy, and we got nerd enough to start there. How about, boy, you lucky. <laughs> boy, you lucky. You, you know? know? Yeah, you so know. you sit and you, you don't look. Don't realize it. Don't, you don't realize even it. understand. Yes. So we're going to have a real talk today, and, um, you know, and we're going to realize the fact that it hasn't been luck. You have an assignment. We all have an assignment. You know, everyone was created with an assignment in life. And your assignment is to solve problems for those that you were sent to. We are sent to somebody, you know, and somebody is sent to us to solve problems. So today we are going to talk to an individual because I'm going to tell you straight up. Miss Maddie Carruthers is my sister and she has solved so many problems for so many individuals that we are going to now. Some of y'all might call it bragging, but it ain't bragging. We're talking about blessings. And so, um, you know, the thing is to, you got to tell it. When God has blessed you, you have to reach out, Maddie, and we have to just make sure that individuals uh, get a chance to see that um, life is not always crazy. You know, Man. Yeah. Life might be a little struggle. You know, it might be hard at times. I, you know what? I, can y'all tell me, is there anywhere in the Bible where it says it's going to be nice and smooth all the way? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've never seen that. I do the word, yeah. And see, y'all, y'all was uh, your pastor was Della Reese. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I know Miss Della yeah. would tell you, baby, y'all get to be ready to do battle. Oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, Della didn't say kick back because we, you know, we got it going on. No, you got to do battle. Yeah. So today we are going to talk about your assignment because you know uh, was, uh, everybody celebrates holidays and uh, but do you take time to ask yourself why are you still here? Yes. Do you take time to ask yourself that? Why am I still here? Well, today, like I said, we're going to lock in and make it all come together. And we're going to just have a ball. And we're going to roll with it. And uh, my, my, like I said, my family looks a little nervous, but we're going to be all right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because, man, we're going to shake it off and do, and do what we do. Yeah. Well, and, it's the first time for everything. Yeah. We're glad to be here. Yeah. We're paid to do it right here. Man. Well, you, you're in the right place, baby. you in the right place. Come here home intoxicated Ooh, So you better take your time With me Cause I remember last time You would hear me make love to me Then you fell fast asleep Wouldn't even talk to me Crazy baby, I'm so crazy. I wanted you to raise my mind. I got the keys. Please, for me, since you're coming home intoxicated. Huh? 